Lisa Broom of the University of North Carolina School of Law. She's currently the director of the School Center for Banking and Finance and head of the school's diverse, uh, director diversity initiative which works to increase gender, racial, and ethnic diversity on corporate boards of directors. So Professor Broom, I think it's safe to assume you're on the pro side of uh, these diversity requirements. Thanks for leading off. Uh, our next uh, speaker will be Professor Cheryl Wade of St. John's uh, University School of Law. There she teaches on issues of race and gender, business organizations, corporate governance, and accountability. Professor Wade has ex written extensively on the intersection of race and business. Thank you for bringing your expertise to this discussion, Professor Wade. And third up will be Professor uh, Stephen Bainbridge of UCLA School of Law. Professor Bainbridge currently focuses on business associations and corporate law. He has written over 100 law review articles, including on the subject of law and economics of public corporations. Uh, Professor Bainbridge, thanks for joining us in between writing all those law review articles. And finally, we'll hear from Professor Jesse Fried of Harvard Law School. Professor Fried teaches on the areas of corporate law and has done extensive research on the areas of the, these diversity requirements. If I'm not mistaken, Professor Fried, I think some of your research has even been cited by plaintiffs in some of the litigation over these diversity le leg uh, leg uh, reg requirements. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, before starting the panel, I would like to give everyone the CLE code. Uh, that is once again, it's and so now, Professor Brainbridge, I'll turn it over to you for the background and some and your your talks. Yeah, I think I'm starting, um, Professor. Sure. Yes, go ahead, Professor Broom. Okay, so I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So thank you uh, to the Federalist Society for setting this up. I'm anxious to hear what all of our panelists have to say. I get the pleasure today of sort of setting the stage for the discussion and talking about these new diversity requirements that Judge Bumatre uh, mentioned. And then I will tell you a little bit about my own views. So let's start off with some diversity statistics. Corporate board demographic diversity is increasing, but it still lags substantially the diversity of our population. In 2010, 15.7% of all Fortune 500 board seats were held by women. That increased to 26.5% uh, by 2020. But of course, women still account for slightly over half of our population. In 2010, people of color held 12.8% of Fortune 500 board seats. That increased uh, slightly to 17.5% in 2020, but still far less than the almost 40% of the U.S. population composed of people of color. So there are several different approaches uh, that we're going to talk about today to trying to increase corporate board diversity. One approach is by imposing a mandate or a quota. And Norway really kicked this off uh, back in the early 2000s uh, and were followed by many other countries, uh, especially in the European area. Uh, the Norway quota was that each gender have at least 40% of corporate board seats. I never thought that we would see quotas in the United States, but I forgot about California. In 2018, California enacted SB 826, and it requires at least one female director on the board of a public company incorporated in or headquartered in California by the end of 2019. By the end of this year, 2021, a minimum of three female directors must be present if the board has six members or more and a minimum of two female directors if the board is composed of five directors and one if the uh, board is four directors or less. There is a $100,000 fine that may be imposed for not achieving uh, this quota, and that fine increases to $300,000 for any second or subsequent violations. That was followed in 2010 by AB 979, also in California, which requires that by the end of this year, 2021, at least one director be from a underrepresented community. And that is defined uh, as self-identification by the director as a person of color or, or 
gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. By the end of 2022, a minimum of three directors from these underrepresented communities must be present if the board has nine or more directors, two directors from underrepresented communities if the number of directors on the board is from five to eight, and one uh, underrepresented community representative if the board is four or less with the same fine structure uh, that I def described for the gender requirement, $100,000 for the first offense, $300,000 thereafter. Uh, the judge also mentioned a recent uh, NASDAQ proposal that was approved by the SEC, which takes a different approach, not a quota or mandate, but rather a diversity target uh, which if it is not met, has, if it's not complied with, then there is an explanation that is required. So target and comply or explain. NASDAQ first made its proposal to the SEC uh, December 1, 2020. They amended their proposal uh, and filed the amendment February 26th of 2021. And it was approved by the SEC just a little over a month ago on August 6th. Obviously, it applies only to NASDAQ listed companies. The uh, target is two diverse directors or explain why not. One of the diverse directors must be female and one must identify as an underrepresented minority, which again is the self-reported person of color or LGBTQ plus status. Uh, some refinements to this proposal, I think mainly introduced in the February amendment were, if the company is a smaller reporting company in terms of market cap or revenues, the second diverse director may be a second female. And if the company has five or fewer directors, it need to have only one diverse director. SPACs are exempt until there is a business combination and then they have two years uh, to comply. And the, there is a very generous phase in of all of these targets. One diverse director um, by two years out, August 7th, 2023, and the two diverse directors by 2025 or 2026, four or five years out, depending on which NASDAQ exchange the stock is traded on. Also, I think very significantly, there is a board, the board diversity proposal by NASDAQ also requires, and this is really the only requirement, a standardized matrix to disclose board diversity along these standard categories, uh, which are described in more detail um, in the proposal. Now, if uh, the diverse director is LGBTQ+, that is not reported that status by gender or by race or ethnicity, just an overall in aggregate. This um, standardized matrix that discloses the div board diversity must appear in the company's proxy, its 10K or on its website. And that requirement goes into effect within one year on uh, August 8th of 2022. Also NASDAQ is providing one year of free assistance to companies who aren't able to meet the target uh, to help them search for diverse directors through search networks that they have uh, relationships with. The state of Washington has also enacted a similar uh, target comply or explain um, regime uh, with 25% female board representatives by January 1, 2022, so the end of this year, or an explanation of how the company considered those from diverse groups during its nomination process. I think it's also important to recognize that investors and proxy advisors are extremely interested in board diversity. BlackRock, for instance, uh, would asks that there be at least two female board members and that there be a disclosure of demographic data of board members. Vanguard will vote against nominating and governance committee chairs if there is insufficient progress on board diversity. ISS, the proxy advisor with, will recommend withholding votes for the chair of the nomination committee if there is either a lack of racial or ethnic diversity on the board or a lack of disclosure about racial or ethnic diversity by 2022. Um, so the disclosure piece of the NASDAQ proposal I think is important. It also uh, adds on to a 2010 SEC requirement about disclosure uh, 
which is uh, requiring disclosure of whether the board has considered diversity in its board nomination process, and if the board has a diversity policy, that it describe its implementation and assess its effectiveness. Now that 2010 proposal left it to the company to define diversity and companies defined it in many ways, some of which included these demographic characteristics noted in NASDAQ and by California. Many companies also said, of course, we consider diversity, but we don't have a policy, uh, some because they did not want to describe the policy or assess its effectiveness. So as a board diversity advocate, I appreciate the effect that the California mandate uh, and quotas are having. The mandate has been effective in increasing the gender diversity since that was required as of 2019. A progress report from the California Partners Project reported that since 2018, when the statute went into effect, the number of public company board seats held by women in California public companies has increased 93.6%. And also, uh, almost all of the smallest California public companies now have at least one female board director, up from only 47% of those smaller companies having one female board director in 2018. Um, and I think this shows uh, the power of the quota um, because there was on the books a 2013 California Concurrent Resolution 62 non-binding, encouraging board gender diversity. And um, from the time that became effective in 2013 to 2018, uh, female board representation only increased from 15.5% to 16%. Now, having said all that, I do have some concerns with the California mandate. One, I am worried that it will tokenize or has the potential to tokenize diverse directors, whether they be female, people of color, or LGBTQ+. Also, I'm concerned about its application to companies headquartered in California, but not incorporated in California. Uh, and many people have pointed to the internal affairs doctrine and said that voting for board directors is an internal affair of the corporation and should be governed by the state of incorporation, not by the state where the company is headquartered. One potentially could argue that this is a social policy rather than an internal affair, and perhaps that justifies the California attempt to regulate. There are also equal protection concerns, which I'm sure we'll hear about both at the state and the federal level, and legal challenges, as has been alluded to, have been brought based on those concerns. Now, the NASDAQ proposal I really like because, and the thing I really like about it, is the disclosure aspect. If shareholders value board diversity, then they can show it with their votes and they can see what the uh, diversity is on the board and they can see it on a standardized basis from company to company so that they are comparing apples to apples. And I'm also very comfortable with the comply or explain. NASDAQ has made it clear that they are not going to evaluate or rate the explanation, but as long as there is some credible attempt to explain why we couldn't find or we don't think we need this type of diversity, that that will be sufficient. My concern with the NASDAQ target is that the target does not end up becoming a cap, especially when it is as low as two diverse board members. It's not a very high hurdle to meet. Uh, the NASDAQ frequently asks questions that are available on their website say that uh, one director who is diverse on gender, for instance, as well as on race or sexual orientation, does not fulfill the two diverse director requirement that you have to, you cannot have a twofer, for instance. The California statutes do not specify this. So perhaps for the very first time, a woman of color would have an advantage here. Also, I like the NASDAQ proposals assistance to help find qualified diverse directors um, but I will note that the NASDAQ proposal is also being challenged on equal protection grounds, although I don't think the challenge is as strong there as it is potentially for the California statute. Boards have very low turnover. Uh, so that is another problem. And I believe that there is a tendency for boards when they are nominating for an open director seat to think about people who they know. And often that is people who look and think like them. 
So I think it is a good idea for organizations, whether there's a mandate or a target or a comply or explain, to reach out to organizations um, like the Director Diversity Initiative, which I head up at the UNC School of Law, and others that are cataloged on our website, ddi.law.unc.edu, that are focused on board diversity to find director candidates with the skill set needed by the company who can also provide diverse perspectives, which will enrich the pool of candidates that can be considered for that board seat. If we continue to limit candidates for board seats to current C-suite members, we will likely not find very many diverse board members. There are many others outside this group who have the demonstrated expertise, leadership, and integrity to make important board contributions. So I'm um, glad that we have seen uh, these two efforts move us along that path. Thank you. Professor Wade, go ahead. Thank you, Lisa, for um, giving us that background. It allows me to focus on um, my views about the two rules. I'm going to make a couple of specific comments about each of the rules, and then I'll go to more general points about diversity efforts. Well, first, the NASDAQ rule. As Lisa explained, it requires listed companies to have two diverse directors, including at least one woman and at least one member of an unrepresented community. So that's a good idea because at least this rule attempts to define diversity, unlike the 2010 uh, board diversity rules. But the definitions are vague and broad and they try to collapse too much into one iteration uh, of the rule. They try to do too much. And first of all, let me just say my um, view that the rule or the language is vague uh, relates to several parts of the rule, but particularly the use of the term diverse candidates. That's an inaccuracy um, because the candidates themselves are not diverse. I'm an African-American woman, uh, but I am not diverse. I do bring diversity to the board. So I think more accurate language would help with respect to the implementation of the rules to use candidates who bring diversity rather than diverse candidates because it normalizes candidates who are white and male. Um, and I could talk more about that if there's time in the Q and A. Um, the other point I want to make with respect to the vagueness of the language um, is, is that the focus on women and underrepresented communities reflects no knowledge of uh, the, one of the most important lessons of critical race theory, and that is intersectionality. It presumes that all women are white, all people of color are male. It ignores the intersectionality between gender and uh, between race and sexuality. And I'll talk more about that also if there's time in the Q&A. But let me talk about what I perceive as the as the idea that the rule is overly broad. Issues that plague the LGBTQ plus community, for example, are important, very important, but very different from issues with which the black community, for example, grapples. Let me just give you an example. There has been a presumption of incompetence that attaches to African-Americans um, is a presumption of intellectual acuity that derives from historical events, enslavement, the justification of enslavement, and all that occurred in the years after that. This kind of presumption of in incompetence simply does not occur in the same way for members of the LGBTQ community. Another point I want to make before I get to some more general observations is some practical advice that was offered by attorneys on a corporate governance blog. Um, they suggested that women and underrepresented minorities and members of the LGBTQ community, their language, be included in the initial pool of candidates when selecting new director nominees. And they described this as a form of Rooney rule. And you can see how this allows for merely cosmetic approaches that are just window dressing. Um, it, you have uh, a couple of what 
are labeled diverse candidates and you have them in the pool and you engage in the same kind of decision making um, that you would have engaged in otherwise. So it won't change very much with respect to diversity and it also wastes money that could have gone to shareholders. Now, I don't really have time to say much with respect to the California rule, other than I think uh, I, I, I fully support it. But of course, it's much more complicated in the US than um, the quota rule in Norway uh, because of the racial heterogeneity in the US. But let me just talk now uh, with the time I have left about some general points that relate to both of these rules. The rules, uh, they um, are tainted with what I have called in some law review articles, diversity doublespeak. And doublespeak is language that obfuscates the real point. It obscures the problem, for example, with respect to diversity doublespeak, it obscures the problem of discrimination, sexism, racism, and focuses on happy, positive comments, uh, 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 ideas like diversity and equity and inclusion. We've got to label issues in order to deal adequately with them. So the problem is not just a lack of diversity. What we have to do, in my opinion, is consider why there is a lack of diversity. And Lisa gave a very good account of that, that people often look to other people in their, in their circles, in their networks. Um, the kind of um, bias and discrimination that I'm describing this, in this regard is not morally blameworthy. It's what we've inherited um, in the United States. We've inherited um, this um, way of decision-making that ex excludes many of the people who are targeted or considered in these statutes. Now, of course, or in these rules, of course you, all understand that a lot of um, activity has been driven by the business of diversity. It's become a business with lots of things going on, but with very little change or impact. So I think that the proper focus is diversity, but we have to include discrimination, anti-racism, uh, and, and anti-sexism. With this kind of consideration, we're able to uh, change the advocacy for diversity. We are supplicants when we ask for diversity, but if we look at this as a compliance issue, all companies must comply with the laws uh, that prohibit discrimination, including racial bias, bias on the basis of gender. If we look at it at that way, it becomes a compliance issue and all companies must comply with law. But of course, uh, diversity is relevant, not diversity alone, however. Diversity efforts may get more people of color and white women and members of the LGBTQ community onto corporate boards, but their contributions on the board will still be devalued unless boards confront their own discriminatory practices and attitudes. And again, I want to emphasize that these discriminatory perceptions are not always morally blameworthy. It's the way we've done business in this country, in the business community uh, for centuries. And let me just end by saying, most companies say that diversity is important. And I simply expect companies to do uh, what they say. I'll end there. Thank you, Professor Wade. Uh, Professor Bainbridge? Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be on such a powerful panel with, with so many insights. Um, there are obviously a number of issues that are pertinent to our discussion. Um, has the business case for board diversity been made? Um, if not, is there a social, moral, ethical, uh, historical obligation case to be made? Uh, do the statutes conflict with the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution? And candidly, you know, I follow the literature on all of those issues, but I'm just a humble old corporate lawyer, and 
I may play a constitutional lawyer on Twitter from time to time, but it's really not my wheelhouse. What I want to focus on is the core corporate law concern that I think these statutes raise. And even if you think these statutes' goals are good, are good sound public policy, well, I would hope that you would acknowledge that there is a fundamental flaw in the approach that California has taken. You see, virtually all U.S. corporations are incorporated under the laws of a single state. And of course, uh, we know that there is a debate about the extent to which states compete to attract corporate charters. But there is certainly no doubt that Delaware is the runaway favorite when it comes to uh, people choosing a state of incorporation. Uh, half of the New York Stock Exchange is incorporated in Delaware. 60% of the Fortune 500 is incorporated in Delaware. There are about 300,000 corporations incorporated in Delaware. Um, and there's about 4 million corporations in the United States. So almost one in 10 corporations uh, incorporated in Delaware. And that has important legal consequences because of what's known as the internal affairs doctrine. Now, everybody agrees that the internal affairs doctrine is a rule of conflicts of law, which holds that corporate governance matters, that is internal affairs, are controlled by the law of the state of incorporation. If a company is incorporated in Delaware and I'm a shareholder and I live in California and the company has its principal place of business in Illinois and I sue in federal court in Texas, uh, the court's going to apply Delaware corporate law to an internal affairs dispute. And virtually all U.S. jurisdictions follow the internal affairs doctrine. Now, it is true that there are a couple of states, most importantly, California and New York, that have what are known as pseudo-foreign corporation statutes. These statutes are ones that purport to regulate certain aspects of the internal affairs of companies that are incorporated elsewhere, but which have substantial contacts with either California or New York. Now, the pro problem is that these foreign, uh, pseudo foreign corporation statutes are themselves of rather dubious constitutional validity for reasons that I'll come to in a second. But the California board diversity quota statutes take this idea of regulating pseudo foreign corporations far beyond what California or New York has ever attempted to do before. These are a hyper aggressive application of California law to corporations that um, traditionally would have been regulated by the law of the state of incorporation. California's basic pseudo foreign corporation statute applies only to corporations that have more than 50% of their property, more than 50% of their payroll, more than 50% of their sales in California. You have to have all three. And over and above that, more than half of your shareholders of record have to be held by California residents. If you don't meet those tests, the statute doesn't apply. In addition, the statute does not apply to any public corporation, even a public corporation that has more than 50% of property payroll and sales and more than 50% of shareholders of record. California Code Section 2115 simply doesn't apply. In contrast, the, the diversity quota bills um, apply to publicly traded corporations whose sole contact with California 
is that it has its principal executive office uh, located in California. And it's already been mentioned that the statute's drafting is rather vague. Um, the statute drafting is problematic far beyond the issues that have already been mentioned. For example, what is a principal executive office? That's not a defined term in the statute. It's not a defined term in the federal securities laws. Um, and the only way we know is that um, on your cover of your annual form 10K, you're supposed to indicate where you think your principal executive office is. But in any event, it's the lack of context with California that I think raised the problem. In the leading CTS Corp versus Dynamics Corp decision, the California Supreme, or the US Supreme Court rather, recognized that it's an accepted part of the business landscape in this country for states to create corporations, to prescribe their powers, and to define the rights that are acquired by purchasing their shares. And building on that fundamental principle, the court emphasized that a state has a legitimate interest in regulating uh, the internal affairs of the corporations that it forms. The court went on to explain that the state of incorporation has very legitimate interests and that those interests contribute to the success of our national economy. The court explained that large corporations that are listed on a national exchange will have shareholders in many states and shares that are traded frequently. And the markets that facilitate this national and international participation in the ownership of corporations are essential for providing capital, not only for new enterprises, but also for established companies. And here's Justice Powell and CTS key conclusion. This beneficial free market system depends at its core upon the fact that a corporation, except in the rarest situations, is organized under and governed by the law of a single jurisdiction, the law of the state of its incorporation. Now, to be sure, the court here may be referring not to constitutional principle, but rather to the conflicts of law principle. Having said that, however, there have been a number of signals from the Supreme Court that the internal affairs doctrine actually rises to the level of a constitutional doctrine. Now, admittedly, there's not a lot of case law on this subject, and the leading case comes from a party with a lot of skin in the game, namely the Delaware Supreme Court. But in the Vantage, um, uh, Vantage Point Venture Partners case from back in 2005, the Delaware Supreme Court held that the attempted application of California Section 2115 to a company incorporated in Delaware violated the due process and commerce clauses of the US Constitution. The court explained that directors and officers of corporations have a significant right to know what the law will be applied to their actions. Stockholders have a right to know by what standards of accountability they may hold those managing the corporation's business and affairs. <clears throat> Critically, the court explained that under the Commerce Clause, a state such as California has no interest in regulating the internal affairs of foreign corporations. Therefore, this court has held that an application of the internal affairs doctrine is mandated by constitutional principles. Now, assuming that's right, the California statutes are unlikely to survive judicial scrutiny. A board's gender diversity is a matter of internal corporate governance. Among other things, it impacts the role of the board's nominating committee and selecting directors. It impacts shareholder voting, right? If the shareholders don't vote the right way to elect the right candidates, 
the corporation will be subject to fines and so forth. Um, and the California statutes interfere with both of those basic principles of internal affairs. The statutes constrain a board's ability to designate directors in the event of a vacancy. They interfere with the shareholder franchise. So in my view, California cannot constitutionally require that corporations headquartered in California but chartered in Delaware have specified board diversity, uh, meet specified board diversity requirements. Now, that's not to say that the California statute, in my view, would be unconstitutional if it were limited to companies that are incorporated in California, All right? If Delaware wanted to adopt such a statute and apply it to all companies incorporated in Delaware, from a corporate law perspective, there would be no objection, right? Now, you obviously, you might still have equal protection objections or whatever. But my point simply is, is that regardless of how laudable uh, the particular policy goal may be, um, the implementation of the policy uh, conflicts with a basic constitutional principle that matters, that is the basic constitutional principle that makes corporate law work. Um, if we start carving out exceptions to the internal affairs doctrine, we'll end up re-balkanizing uh, the corporate law landscape in ways that um, the Commerce Clause was intended not to allow. And so, you know, I, if I had a piece, or in closing, if I had a word of advice for the proponents of these legislation, I'd say, you know, be less ambitious, go back to the California legislature and have them limit their law to companies incorporated in California. If you want to make, to make sweeping change, go talk to the Delaware legislature. But don't try to bite off uh, doing it on a nationwide basis in a single state. That's what the Commerce Clause uh, and it's what the Internal Affairs Doctrine is really intended to prevent. So thank you. And I'll look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, uh, Professor Freed. Um, well, first of all, thanks to the Federal Society for organizing this panel. Uh, and uh, it's been very interesting to hear from my fellow panelists. Um, uh, I just want to say a few things about the empirical evidence around board diversity and the push for board diversity in various jurisdictions, um, <clears throat> because my interest is really how do these initiatives affect investor returns? And I'm going to focus on um, the analysis that NASDAQ used to try to convince the SEC to allow it to adopt its rules in which the SEC uh, subsequently embraced when it improved NASDAQ's proposal. So um, when NASDAQ proposed its rules, I, I went through its analysis and I read it very carefully and I looked at all the studies that purport to show that increasing board diversity benefits corporate uh, performance and helps investors. Um, almost all the studies that NASDAQ cites to um, are reports that are prepared by consulting firms and investment banks um, that um, use proprietary data that they don't share, that use their own methodology that they don't share. Um, uh, one might be cynical and say, these materials are designed for investors or investment firms that are looking to figure out where to invest their money and want to do well and do good. And so it's um, in the interest of these consulting firms and investment banks to say that diversity on boards leads to share, you know, higher shareholder returns. Um, um, but we don't really put our, you know, faith on these uh, findings by um, 
consulting firms and investment banks, we want to see what academics have to say about the link between diversity and shareholder value. And um, there's there's basically almost nothing in the NASDAQ analysis on this that attempts to show that board diversity actually leads to higher stock prices. Um, there are basically two studies um, that I found, one of which is uh, published in a very low ranking finance journal uh, whose methodology was subsequently criticized by um, an article that was placed in a, high, a higher ranking finance journal, which is likely to be better. Um, and then there was an, um, <clears throat> another study that showed that board diversity improves shareholder returns, but the way it measured diversity is it created like a synthetic variable that included um, six ingredients, gender, ethnicity, age, college attended, financial experience, and other board experience, lumped them together, found a, um, a causal effect on the magnitude of this variable on shareholder returns. But the results hold if any of the six ingredients are removed, which means that you can't infer that any of the ingredients in this blend actually do anything to increase shareholder value. Um, NASDAQ cites to a bunch of studies that show that if you have diverse boards, it causes certain better cor corporate governance outcomes like more board attendance. Um, but more board attendance doesn't translate necessarily into higher shareholder returns. If you're saving for retirement, um, you know, how much you can retire on depends on how much the stock price goes up, not how much the board meets, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's not really relevant for figuring out whether investors are gonna do better. There is a great study from 2009 by a leading female uh, financial economist published in a top rated journal, um, which is probably the best study of the effect of gender diversity on firm performance. It's a very honest study. Um, she and her co-authors find that when there's more gender diversity on boards, um, there are more board meetings, people show up more, the male directors show up more, pay is more tightly connected to uh, performance. There are a lot of like sort of good outcomes, good corporate governance outcomes, but on average, um, it leads to lower share prices. And she and her co-authors speculate that it's because these more gender diverse boards are over monitoring executives. Um, <clears throat> there are many studies that show that when rules are adopted to force boards to be more diverse, that the stock price goes down. Lisa mentioned the, uh, Norway's um, um, initiative in the early 2000s. Well, there was a very famous paper published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics that showed that investors took a massive hit um, the California law um, that people have talked about. There are at least three studies, uh, one of which I think has already been accepted for publication in a decent finance journal. Uh, the other two are by very reputable financial economists. They've all found that when this law was uh, enacted um, on an adjusted basis, which is the way you measure the impact of legislation on, on, on the stock price, uh, stock prices drop by two and a half percent, um, tens of millions of dollars, and in some case, hundreds of millions of dollars were, were uh, wiped off uh, uh, the, the books for, um, for companies that were affected by the law. And they think that uh, the reason why this is happening is that the boards were going to have to either add directors and pay them for uh, serving on the board, you know, which is, you know, all in, you know, million dollars plus the, the, um, the cost that arise from having a board that's too big, or you'd have to like replace directors that know something about the company with other directors who don't know something about the company. So there's like um, a unanimity of results in, in the reports around the California law. Now the question is like, with, whether what happened in California for the affected companies is going to happen to NASDAQ. NASDAQ, as um, Lisa said, has a, a, a comply or explain rule. So we can imagine a, a happy outcome where, um, you know, boards are nudged in the direction of increasing diversity when it's 
good for the shareholders and not otherwise. And if it doesn't seem to work, they have a good reason. They just explain why they can't do it. I'm uh, worried that we're not going to have a good outcome. I'm worried that what's going to happen is that there's going to be massive pressure put on boards to diversify even when it's not in shareholders' interests. The directors making these decisions on very small stakes of the company. It's you know, painful to be accused of sort of you know, being racist or sexist or um, being like a, a laggard, a social laggard. And so I, I think the pressure is going to be exerted on some of these NASDAQ companies to diversify even when it's not good for the shareholders. Um, one last thing that I want to say before I stop, so hopefully there'll be some time for Q&A. Um, when NASDAQ offered its proposal to the SEC, it pointed to the fact that BlackRock and other large money managers were in favor uh, of diversity disclosure rules. Um, I'm not sure BlackRock is adequately representing the interests of all of the investors in BlackRock. Um, I would say that America is sort of split between conservatives and liberals. Um, and um, I bet if you were to randomly sample their investors and ask them whether they wanted BlackRock to push for diversity, even if it wasn't going to improve shareholder returns, probably half would say yes and half would say no. Um, I think the reason why BlackRock is doing what it's doing is that it's increasingly raising money in Europe from European pension funds. And those pension fund managers are very interested in BlackRock and State Street and the other big money managers um, being able to report to them that they're making efforts in various dimensions to you know, improve diversity, deal with climate change or whatever. And so there's like a competition among State Street, Vanguard, BlackRock to show um, pension funds in Europe and maybe some in the United States as well, that they're like very actively engaged to achieve these social objectives. So the fact that BlackRock is favoring these types of rules doesn't convince me that the, the ultimate beneficiaries in these companies are going to benefit. I'll stop. Great. Thanks so much, Professor Freed. Um, let, let's start. At, well, first of all, I will remind everyone in, uh, out there listening that if you have any questions, please submit it by via the Zoom chat. I'll, I'll select them as they come in. And so we should start bringing them in now. Um, so first off, I'll start with Professor Bro uh, Broom. Do you have any uh, rebuttal to anything you've heard by Professor Freed or Professor Bainbridge? And I think you're still on mute, so if you want to. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, well, I appreciate that uh, Professor Bainbridge's analysis of the internal affairs doctrine, and I learned a lot from that. And I, I agree with him that is an issue of concern for the California statute, and perhaps uh, also in agreement with him that the California legislature may have overstepped uh, uh, to make the point they wanted to make. But it's still, uh, you know, I think I. Uh, uh, the NASDAQ approach and so on are, are still still out there. The California approach would still apply to California uh, domestic corporations. Uh, with respect to Professor Freed's uh, discussion, just a couple of points. Uh, on the empirical case, I, I acknowledge what he's saying about um, the evidence that is currently out there. Much of it obviously was done a long time ago when there wasn't a whole lot of diversity on boards. So if there is anything to the critical mass argument about diversity and that we need a critical mass of, div of uh, diverse perspectives on a board to uh, realize the full force and effect, that potentially could explain some of those results. But uh, we don't demand proof that uh, white men increase shareholder value. So I'm not exactly sure why we have to have a business case being made that other people added into the mix would increase shareholder value as well. Um, a number of years ago, some of my colleagues and I were confounded by this empirical evidence the same way Professor Freed was. And we decided to do a qualitative study where we interviewed um, 50 or more directors of corporations, as well as people that were closely associated with boards to ask them, how do you think board diversity affects how the corporation, how the board performs, how the board works and how the corporation uh, performs. And we got a lot of um, mixed evidence, didn't hear a lot of examples about, oh, the diverse 
members of our board added this value, that value, or this contribution. And we um, came up with a conclusion that maybe this was in part because of the dangerousness of these diversity categories. The non-diverse people that we talked to did not want to engage in stereotyping. Um, and the uh, diverse board members that we talked to didn't want to feel like tokens. They thought their contributions were because they were good board members, not because of their um, identity as a woman or a person of color or both. Also at the time of our interviews over 10 years ago, boards were not as diverse as they are now. So the full effects of having a diverse perspectives on the board may not have been felt. Thanks so much. Uh, Professor Wade, do you have any rebuttal to anything uh, said by Professor Fareed or uh, Bainbridge? Well, I, I agree with Professor Bainbridge, uh, Bainbridge's um, uh, conclusion. I did learn a lot also about the eternal affairs doctrine. I, I think that these rules are important first steps uh, towards uh, the goal of having more women and people of color, if that is a goal. Um, but I have no problem, no quibble with you know, going to the Delaware legislature and limiting um, these kinds of rules to um, the companies incorporated in that particular state. And with respect to Professor Fried, I would say this. So with respect to the business case for diversity, we're looking at shareholder value or we're looking at better corporate practices. But my concern, the goal for me is to address discriminatory practices because the question for all of us should be, why is there a dearth of women and people of color on boards? And for me, there are just two possible answers, that there are discriminatory practices. And, I, and again, I want to emphasize um, that we're not talking about morally blameworthy racism or sexism or homophobia. We're simply talking about processes that have been around, decision-making practices that have been around for centuries, th things that we've inherited. So either there's something wrong with women and people of color, or there's something wrong with, wrong with the process. The second point I want to make is that companies already spend a great deal of money on diversity and diversity practices. So why not take a good look at them and make them work, um, make them less vague and not overly broad. And so to say that one is not sure that shareholder value is enhanced, does not confront the problem that companies are already spending a great deal of money on these goals and shareholder value is not enhanced, nor is there the accomplishment of, of more diversity. I, uh, and let me just end by saying that um, I, I subscribe to the social case for diversity. I don't think there's any need for a business case for diversity. It, 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 the business case for diversity does not to me make a great deal of sense because it would expect, and this is linked to Professor Brune's comments, it would expect a certain perspective from women who are white or women of color or men of color. Um, and that's just not the case. We don't think differently. I don't think differently because I'm African-American. Um, I think about the Supreme Court in this regard. Uh, we had uh, one black man uh, on this court for years and years, Thurgood Marshall. Now we have another black man, Clarence Thomas. And for me, the value is in racial diversity. I want Clarence Thomas to be on the Supreme Court as much as I wanted Thurgood Marshall to be on the Supreme Court. And so, uh, and so I'll end there. Great, thanks so much. Uh, before we move on to more questions, I want to remind everyone that the CLE code is Professor Bainbridge, I thought your discussion about the internal affairs doctrine was, was very good. I have a question. Does that impact at all the NASDAQ rule, since that's not dealing with state incorporations and it's dealing with uh, public companies? And you're also on mute, so if you want to... <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Um, I don't think so, right? The internal affairs doctrine... Uh, rests on the principle that um, states should not regulate uh, corporations that are incorporated in other states. And there's a very long history of the stock exchanges 
regulating matters of internal corporate affairs. The New York Stock Exchange listed company manual has an entire section devoted to um, uh, corporate governance issues that impose requirements that are, for the most part, um, consistent with state law, but require a higher level. Um, and so, for example, um, the New York Stock Exchange says that uh, if you, as a board of directors, want to issue more uh, additional shares, and that transaction would have the effect of increasing the number of outstanding shares by more than 20%, that you have to get a shareholder vote. And that requirement doesn't exist in Delaware law, but nobody has argued, as far as I know, that um, the uh, the New York Stock Exchange voting requirement in that regard is is somehow invalid or unconstitutional. Um, the the self regulatory organizations such as the stock exchanges and Nasdaq, um, as I say, have a long history of regulating these sort of issues. And the only real constraint on their ability to do so uh, is that the SEC is required under Section 19 of the Securities Exchange Act to make a determination that uh, a rule proposed by the exchange is consistent with the public interest and in the interest of investors. Section 19B uh, provides for SEC review of uh, of the uh, uh, stock exchange rules. But the SEC has very little discretion under Section 19B to refuse to approve a rule. The SEC would have to make a determination that it's not in the public interest uh, to have the exchange adopt this rule uh, or that the rule was contrary to the interest of investors. And the times the SEC has exercised that power have mostly been in connection with um, things like brokerage fee charges, where the exchanges were, were basically trying to uh, increase revenues on their members at the expense of shareholders. And, and, and in particular, the current SEC um, you know, at least two members of the SEC um, uh, have already signaled uh, support for the NASDAQ um, proposal. So, so I don't see the SEC uh, striking this down. And once, you know, one of the sort of striking things, and this is the last thing I'll say in answer to your question, We've sort of touched on this before, but I'm currently working on a project relating to corporate purpose and ESG investing, you know, environmental social governance. And there's a lot of what's known as greenwashing uh, these days, where companies are, are basically uh, um, mouthing, at least, adherence to a whole variety of, of progressive goals. And, and part of that has been that very few companies have been willing to step forward and challenge the, um, the California statutes, even under the Internal Affairs Doctrine. Um, and I don't see a, a lot of, I would be very surprised if any NASDAQ companies sort of uh, rose up in opposition to uh, uh, this proposal, uh, certainly not any substantial number, certainly not, you know, Microsoft and Apple and those folks. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we're really close at the end of time. We should have budgeted, I think, two or three hours for this discussion. Uh, but I'll open up uh, with one, uh, close with one last uh, audience uh, participation question from Nathaniel Arnold. He asked, there was talk about equal protection issues under the Constitution, 
But what to what degree do there might might there be issues related to violations of federal civil rights laws, maybe Title VII, when mandating that a protected ca characteristic be a factor in hiring decisions? Um, does anyone want to open that up? I'll jump in. I don't think a director is an employee, so I'm not sure that Title VII applies. Fair enough. And the one other question says you had to get such a quick response. And, you know, uh, Professor Wade discussed this on what the, the meaning of diversity is. One of the audience questions was, should there be opening, should we expand the meaning of diversity? Should it include religion, for example? Yeah, we can expand it so much that it just becomes no definition at all. It just becomes nonsensical. We can define diversity as um, someone who lives in Manhattan versus someone who lives in Queens. I'm a New Yorker. Um, uh, so I think we have there, there are no bright lines here, um, but I think we have to be very careful about what it is we're trying to address. And so that's why I look at specific groups. I look at one racial group at a time in my research, and I, I have focused primarily so far on African-Americans because the issues uh, are different. Thank you. And, uh, you know, well, one last question for Professor Freed. Uh, uh, you know, Professor Wade mentioned that, you know, whether or not the business case exists, it doesn't matter that this is really more about the, the social case. Uh, what's your response to that? that? You know, it seems like you're both two ships passing and it doesn't matter whether or not there's a business case. OK, so. Um, so let's 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 suppose that we all agree that there's a, a, a social case for increasing diversity of boards in the way that it's being done. Um, then there's a question, well, how does it actually impact investors like returns? So one possibility is that there's no effect, uh, in which case, if you think this is good social policy, let's just do it, right? There's no cost to it. Another possibility is that it will actually increase shareholder returns, in which case now you have a business case and a social case for doing it. Everybody should be behind it. The third possibility, which is the one I think is, I think is plausible. I'm not going to say it's most likely, but it's a, it's plausible. Is that when you push for diversity, you reduce shareholder returns, and then you have a trade-off. And Cheryl might want to live in a world where you achieve certain social objectives um, through uh, through diversity mandates at the expense of. Uh, corporate performance, but there might be other people um, in our society that don't want to make that trade-off. At the very least, we should understand if that's if that's a trade-off that has to be made. NASDAQ is trying to sort of paper over this problem by pretending that the evidence indicates that you can have your cake and eat it too. You get the desirable social ob objective satisfied and it's good for investors. I just don't think they make the case. Thanks so much. That, that will have to be the last world. Uh, thanks so much for this great discussion. Everyone out there, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Just a quick close and a thanks on behalf of the Federalist Society um, to our moderator, Trish Punte, to our, all our panelists for tuning in, uh, the benefit of your valuable time and your expertise. Uh, we might be looking at a round two of this. Certainly we could go uh, much longer. There are lots of issues that were left on the table. Um, thank you very much to our audience for calling in for great questions. We're sorry we didn't get to all of them, uh, but we do have them. We encourage you to tune in uh, to future events. So keep an eye on your email and our website for announcements about upcoming uh, events, events like this one and, uh, and lots of other things. So thank you all very much. We are adjourned. Bye. Bye.